Hi, thank you for joining us in worship today. We have a few quick announcements to run over before we get our services started. Grief is a unique journey that affects each one of us at some point in our lives. You're not alone. If you like help understanding your grief, join us for a six week in-person grief support class based on renowned grief counselor, Alan D. Wolfelds, Understanding Your Grief. Head over to cumc.com slash Lent so that you don't miss a single message from our pastoral staff. Join us this year for our Lent study, which will be held online and in person. This year, we'll be reading Witness at the Cross, a beginner's guide to Holy Friday. Be sure to visit cumc.com slash Lent studies to figure out which time and place works best for you. Volt's famous spaghetti sauce is finally back. Proceeds go to the Vision of Light team in support of future mission trips. Ticket sales start March 6th through the 20th from 8.30 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. You'll be able to pick up your order by the south entrance on March 27th. For more info, go to cumc.com slash spaghetti. And we are thankful to have you in worship with us this Sunday, and we hope that you continue to walk with us on our mission of loving God, serving others, and transforming lives here at Christ United. Well, good morning. My name is Reagan Gilliland. I'm the pastor of Adult Discipleship here at Christ United, and we're delighted that you are joining us as we kick off our Lenten series, An Extraordinary Life. Um, a few announcements or clarifications. Um, just so you know, the grief class you can still um, jump into. Um, also, uh, our Lent study, there's still time to sign up for that, and our devotions, you can go to cumc.com slash Lent to do that. One thing that was not in the video is that outside these doors, you'll see a poster of uh, something called Change Changes Lives. And this is a church-wide thing. It's not just a children's thing. But we're collecting change to hopefully raise $5,000 to buy livestock, not for us, um, to donate to Heifer International. And so we would love for you to partner with us. Um, you can bring your, if you fill your change jar up anytime, you can bring it on Sunday. We can dump it for you, or you can bring it on Palm Sunday. Uh, but we're looking forward to doing that as a church-wide um, sort of thing during the Lent. So I hope you join us and grab a jar on your way out today. Um, today is uh, Dr. Julia Lee, our new organist. It's officially her first Sunday as staff. I know many of you were here on Ash Wednesday, but we're so glad, so we thought we'd give her a w warm welcome from Christ United. And with that, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning, friends. I am Reverend Stephanie Reed Meyer, pastor of our modern worship service. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit as together we lift our voices this morning in a call to worship. Jesus began his ministry to the world, led by the spirit into the wilderness. As we begin our Lenten journey, let us be led by the spirit, even into the uncomfortable places. In those 40 days and in that place, Jesus was faced with hunger, doubt, and temptation. As we seek to follow Jesus, we would be led even into the uncomfortable choices. Jesus left the wilderness faithful and obedient to God, rejoicing in the one in whom he trusted. As we continue on our path to faithfulness, we will be led by our Christ, rejoicing in the Lord our God. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we join together in our opening hymn number 269, Lord, who throughout these 40 days.
Good morning, I'm Mike Flynn, pastor for Care Ministries, and I invite you to join in the Apostles' Creed as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I love our new bumpers. It looks like we know what we're, what we're doing, like we are got it together, but I can assure you we don't know what we're doing, at least <laughs> based on 845. It was a little rough. So I'm glad you're here at the second service. That's all I could say. Um, no, I'm delighted that we are kicking off our Lenten series, An Extraordinary Life. Um, we'll be journeying through the book of Luke over the next several weeks, and Luke has some of the most beloved stories, and we're not going to be able to hit all of them because we have a short amount of time. But we'll be looking at the story of the temptation of Christ, which is today, um, Jesus' first sermon, um, some healings, some teachings, and miracles, and then of course we will go into Holy Week kicking off with Palm Sunday. And so I hope you journey with us the next several weeks because I think it will be a wonderful series. So as I said, today we're starting with the temptation of Christ, but I thought it would be helpful to tell you what happens right before this. So in Luke chapter 3, we know that the Holy Spirit has descended upon him because he, he was baptized, and a voice comes from heaven that says, You are my son, whom I love and am well pleased. And then there's listed this long genealogy of Christ with the heavy hitters like David, Boaz, who we just kind of learned about with our Ruth series, Jacob, Abraham. And so you would think after this incredibly holy moment, this, this sacred kind of anointing as he's been baptized, that it would send Christ immediately into some really big ministry act, whether it was a huge miracle or some great big teaching, like he has to be revved up. He has to be charged. He has to be pumped up. It was like he had the halftime pep talk in the locker room. He's ready to go out. The classic 90s jock jam song, Let's Get Ready to Rumble, plays from the heavens. But instead, what we find is that he goes to the wilderness. 
to be alone, to essentially sit and do nothing. It's not what we expect. But what happens in the wilderness is important. And so let's go ahead and read today's scripture, Luke 4, starting in chapter, uh, ch- chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil, he ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. It was the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So after I, I read this, I feel like Jesus could have wrapped this up very quickly and just said, not today, Satan. I don't know if you're familiar with that kind of pop culture phrase. Uh, people say it a lot. In fact, you can get lots of things on Etsy with it. So I Googled it. Um, if you're looking for a new desk sign, there's not today Satan. Maybe if you have a meeting with a boss you don't like, you can just put that out passive aggressively. Um, you can get these wonderful pencils that say not today Satan, not today. They're labeled as a great stocking stuffer on Etsy. Um, there's this great t-shirt of Jesus schooling the devil at basketball. So that's a great gift as well. Also, if you like doing cross-stitch, maybe give this a a whirl. Um, And then there's, of course, this badge you could put on. But my favorite, uh, these are labeled as planner stickers. So I'm just thinking, like, what if you forgot to put it on one day, and you're like, oh, Satan's going to get me this Tuesday. I forgot to put my sticker in my planner for today. But um, kind of a funny phrase, but there's a reason that Jesus just didn't uh, shut Satan down at that moment. There were some important things that needed to happen. And so today I thought I would kind of go through the whole scripture kind of piece by piece, things that I feel like God revealed to me, things that I had never noticed before, things that it ties back to the Old Testament. So we know that we start chapter four um, with Jesus being filled with the Spirit. Like I said before, he had just been baptized, and so he's, he's riding high on that. He's been kind of anointed. And we read that he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So he wasn't tricked. He wasn't coerced by the devil to go there, but rather the Spirit felt it necessary for him to go into the wilderness for some sort of preparation. And maybe this is hard for us to understand because we think of Christ more as God rather than a human, but we know that Jesus was both fully human and fully God. Now, don't get me wrong, Christ was definitely wise and had a leg up on people, but this humanist factor pointed to Jesus needing to grow, to learn, to prep, to gain wisdom just like the rest of us. If he didn't, I think uh, if you know the story when Jesus um, gets lost and Mary and Joseph find him in the temple at the age of 12, If he had everything figured out, I think he would have just stayed there. But he went back home where he had to grow and mature like any other boy at his age. And so I look at this desert story as an act of making sure that Jesus was in fact ready 
and prepared for the ministry and work ahead. For 40 days, Jesus is tempted, and this, this number 40, we know, comes from, there's a lot of um, connection, especially to the Israelites wandering for 40 years, when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai for 40 days, and the people below <laughs> start to do idol worshiping. And so Luke is establishing, look, Jesus has a connection. He has heritage of Israel. And to take it a, 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 another step, the first temptation has to do with bread. And as, if you recall, when the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness, they have manna that comes from heaven. Some of them don't follow God's instructions, so it ends up stinking, full of worms. Another thing I want to point out is that um, we know from the their very beginning that Jesus was famished. She hadn't been eating. And I don't know about you, but when I am famished, I'm vulnerable. There's a reason you don't go grocery shopping when you're hungry, right? You make poor choices. And so we've got Jesus extremely vulnerable at this moment. And the whole story of the incarnation is showing the willingness of God to come to us and be vulnerable. And maybe you don't like the idea of God being vulnerable because you equate that with weakness, and you don't want a weak God, but I think it's vitally important for us to understand how much risk God put forth coming to us on account of how much God loves us and how much God wants to be in relationship with us. God was willing to put God's self into vulnerable situations for us. Don't think that Jesus had some super strength in this and somehow was exempt from hunger or exhaustion or temptation because he wasn't. And it doesn't make Jesus less of God, but I believe it brings his humanness kind of forth, because sometimes I feel like we put his humanness on the back burner. Again, it doesn't mean that he is less God, but it shows that Jesus could both be strong and weak at the same time, just like us. The first temptation has a lot of layers when the devil says, you know, if you are testing Jesus to see if he will go out and prove in some extravagant way that he is the son of God. The devil is really trying to see, okay, Jesus, are you going to think only of yourself? Because that will teach, maybe it will teach others not to rely on God, to take things into their own hands, to not have that dependence or trust or faith in God. And I feel like through the whole thing, Jesus is, or the devil is poking at Jesus, like, are you just going to take care of yourself? Are you going to think about only your needs? But Jesus uh, is one that comes not to be served, but to serve, to take care of others, to save others. His needs, his desires, his wants always come last. In our own lives, how much are we tempted to immediately take care, care of ourselves first? How do we put others before us? And Jesus says, you know, it's not about physical needs when he says you don't live by bread alone, which is a call back to Deuteronomy. It's a way of Jesus saying, look, I didn't come just to meet physical needs. I came for much more than that. Also, on a, a side note, I mean, it's just to turn a stone into bread. I mean, Jesus clearly could have done a lot more. He could have had I don't know if you're Harry Potter fans, but a Hogwarts banquet, you know, in the snap of his fingers, I'm sure. So it's really not a challenge. Most of what the devil asks or tempts him is, to me, at times, quite laughable, which brings me to the second uh, temptation. So the devil leads him up to a mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and offers Jesus authority over it all. Like, hey, Jesus, I could, I could give you glory it's like the devil is a really bad car salesman because I feel like Jesus looks at everything and it probably took all of his power not to say something sarcastic like, you mean I can have authority over the things that I already have authority over? Wow, what a deal. You don't have to look much further after this story to see how 
much authority Christ has. Between commanding unclean spirits, forgiving sins, giving authority to his 12, it's clear that Jesus has authority. He does not need it from the devil. But I think there's some things going on here. Jesus is not going to take the easy way out. I think it's abundantly clear as we journey uh, later into this story. But Jesus came to do work. Many of us, including myself, may miss at times how much work Jesus did, and he was thoughtful and sometimes slow. He was led by the Spirit, but he did a lot. He journeyed from place to place. He sometimes would go off by himself. He gave himself time before he went to see Mary and Martha after Lazarus died. He didn't just stay in one town. Again, he didn't just wait for people to come to him. He traveled around. He went to people. He met with difficult people. He had difficult conversations. He did not avoid conflict, got mad, and flipped tables in a temple. And so for the devil just to say, here on this platter so neat and easy, take it. Jesus would say, that's not what I came here to do. For us, I think it's a good reminder that to serve Christ is to roll up our sleeves, work hard, and get involved. Most importantly, Jesus' power and authority is from God. His allegiance is to no one else. An overarching theme through this whole story is a call back to Deuteronomy 6.4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. God, the Lord alone, you shall love the Lord with Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. To give that up, to worship anything other than God would be Jesus betraying not only God, but his entire Jewish heritage. Now the third temptation is a little bit different. Throughout this story, Jesus has not said much He's mainly just quoted scripture back. This time the devil presents the temptation quoting from Psalm 91, which we read, for he will command angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus knows not to test God. And this vignette can look at a Um, foreshadowing of the scene of the Garden of Gethsemane when Christ is tempted strongly to ask God to take the cup from him. But ultimately, he asks that God's will be done and not his. I don't know about you, but the temptation to test God, to put God on the spot, to demand of God is all too familiar to us. There have been times that I've probably even kind of mocked God and said, man, if you are God, then do this. If you are God, then you will show up and... But through Jesus' ministry, death and resurrection, there's this uh, beauty in his acceptance of all he has to do. It's a great model. See, what I think is so extraordinary about Jesus is how he often is not extraordinary. When I think about what Jesus could have done in this story, how he could have really showed off his skills and capabilities, his power, his holiness, but then he chooses not to. The whole taunting of, well, if you are, is laughable. Of course Jesus is God. Of course he is the son of God. He knows his powers, his abilities, but he doesn't need to be forced to show what he can do. You see that at other times when his disciples want him to do something or to put someone in their place, Christ is steady and measured and not there to make a production of things. That's one thing I love about him most, that he kind of shows up in the world as this meek and mild and humble kind of guy. And everything he does, his focus is to be with God, to follow God, to listen to God, and to understand his role, no matter what is asked of him. Include being sent as a vulnerable baby, to growing up in a small town, to being poor, to living under oppression, 
um, to having to wait and grow and learn and mature before being set out into the world to being tempted. An extraordinary life? Yes. But extraordinary for our times, it was extraordinarily normal. I pray over the next few weeks you will journey with us and be captivated by this extraordinary life and also how extraordinarily normal he sometimes went about things. It's going to be a wonderful several weeks, so I hope you come back. Because next week we will hear his first sermon, which if you know how that ends, not great. It's every preacher's fear (laughs) when they preach a sermon. So you'll have to come back next week to see how it ends. Amen. We now come to our time where we lift up our offerings. But before we do this, a note that the flowers in the sanctuary this morning are given in memory of Jeannie Jones, beloved wife of John Jones, mother of Jeanette and Johnny Jones, and grandmother of Ashton and Farron. So we give thanks for the life and the memory of Jeannie. Again, we're glad that you're here with us worshiping either online or here in the sanctuary. If you're online, please remember to register. And here you can use either your blue pew card or the QR code on the back of your bulletin. And as always, we continue to be so thankful for the many ways that you support all of the missions and the ministries here at Christ United. In particular, there's a special opportunity now to help Ukrainian refugees through our work in Poland several years ago. The Polish UMC pastor that our inspiring travel team worked with during our four trips to Poland has recently reached out for help to care for Ukrainian refugees, and he's working to find shelter at many of the local UMCs in Poland. So any donation that you can provide either by marking Poland on your checks or giving online at cumc slash serving others will go directly to this special offering. So again, thank you for all that you do in Christ United, both here in the community and in the world.
Please be seated. This morning on the first Sunday of Lent, we have the opportunity to partake of Holy Communion with one another. And what a special blessing that is this morning. Before we get into our liturgy, I do want to uh, let you know that this morning we will be offering communion at four stations here at the front. This communion will be offered through intinction, which means that you will place your hands out to receive a piece of bread. Then you can take that bread and dip it into the cup and then consume it. If you are not comfortable dipping your bread into the cup, that's okay. You don't have to. You can say, no, thank you, uh, and you're no less holy for it. Or, even better, if you feel more comfortable in the back, we have prepackaged communion available. So however you are most comfortable this morning, we want to make sure that you feel welcome to take communion. That being said, there's also a gluten-free station here at the front. So many options. I do want to remind you all that here at Christ United, we practice an open table. That means that you do not have to be a member here. You do not have to have the whole Christian thing figured out to take communion. Instead, all that we ask is that you are open to the Holy Spirit working in your life. If you are, you are welcome at this table. Let us join together this morning in Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And on your holy mountain, he heard your still small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness, where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during 40 days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us each from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. And on the night Christ gave of himself for us, it was at that meal that he took the bread, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, when the meal was over, Christ took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, drink from this, all of you. This is a sign of my new covenant, one made by spirit and the water. As often as you drink from this cup, 
do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his great love. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. invite those who are assisting with communion to please come forward at this time.
Please join me in our prayer after receiving communion. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join in the singing of our closing hymn, Jesus Tempted in the Desert, found, found on the handout on your way into the sanctuary. You may be seated. So you know when you start um, or you try to start a diet and then you start your morning with donuts, you're like, well, might as well just eat whatever I want the rest of the day. That's sometimes how we feel with Lent when we think, well, we're already a few days in, so what's the point of doing something now? Um, in my newsletter on Friday, I talked about how we as Methodists, we're thinkers and we are learners. And so I pray that for the remainder of this Lenten season that you would take time to grow and to learn and to think because I think the example today is that Jesus needed that time too. And so if he needs it, so do we. So may this season be a time of learning and growing and transforming. May you go in peace today. Amen. Amen.